Somebody give me a definition of what a hero is. Batman. All right, well, what makes uh, Batman a hero? Merle, what makes him a hero? Okay, he can do things other people can't. That's a good, good definition. What else? What else we got out there? What makes, anybody have any heroes? Somebody you look up to. Somebody you look up to. Good, good. Somebody that uh, you probably think of with courage. Um, does it mean a hero is perfect? It's not, it doesn't mean a hero would be perfect because there would only be one true hero. And, there, and maybe there is, but, but to think about uh, heroes and what makes up a hero. David, what's on your mind? Integrity. I'm sorry, integrity. Integrity. Yeah, integrity. So you look at someone and you think uh, this, this individual's got some integrity. When, uh, when we think about Bible heroes, you, you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And there's men and women both listed there that the Hebrew writer tells us about who are heroes. You get down about verse 32 and, and David is mentioned. Um, what we're going to talk about, and I don't think we're going to cover all this, so if we, I'm not planning on it, okay? There's just, like you said, no way. And, and really, this is just such a small part. But I hope maybe what we do talk about, I hope we'll share some things that either uh, you haven't thought about before or remind you of some things that, that maybe have slipped your mind. I hope you brought your Bibles. We're going to do it. As you know, it's on your sheet. There's a lot of passages that we're going to talk about. I wanted to share some things. Now, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Uh, that'll work like that, I guess. Um, I don't know if I skipped the introduction. There it is. When you think about David, he is mentioned in uh, first, I'm lazy because at Branford, they do this for me. I don't touch, I don't touch a lot of stuff, but uh, anyhow, I'll, I'll try to remind me point if I don't do it. All right. Um, David is mentioned 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 Chronicles, Psalms in the Old Testament. Of course, he's also mentioned in, in the New Testament. We know Revelation, we know Matthew, we know the book of Acts. So different places there. You notice on your sheet, he's the first person mentioned after Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And then he's the last person mentioned by name in the New Testament after Christ in Revelation 22, 16. So, so David was definitely a part of God's scheme and part of God's plan. And not only do you read about it throughout the Old Testament as, as the second king of Israel, but then you get over the New Testament and you see how God had a plan. And that plan came through Abraham and through Abraham's seed all the way down and went through uh, David's seed and to, the, to we get to Christ. And so we find that he's such an a, a important part. What's amazing in Acts 13, Paul is speaking, and you'll, I think it's up there. You find that, um, that God said, it wasn't that Paul said it. God said, David was a man after my own heart. Somebody tell me, what, what does that mean, a man after God's own heart? Y'all do talk, right? I mean, <laughs> I do know a little sign language if that helps. I think he's emulating God. Really trying to emulate God. Trying to, to, to do what he thinks God would do. It would appear David had a, a good heart. Wasn't, we'll talk, if we get time tonight, we'll see some things. Uh, my lesson last night, we've been talking about giants in our lives. And we talked about resentment. And David held a resentment for 40 years. Uh, and, to, and he's on his deathbed. And while he's there on his deathbed, uh, he brings Solomon in. And he shares that resentment that he's had with Joab. But, but so David wasn't perfect. But obviously there were some things about David that, that uh, caught God's attention. And when Paul wrote about him in Acts 13, he, he said, God said, here's a man that's after my own heart. Wouldn't that be uh, something incredible to put on your epitaph? Wouldn't that be, you know, have your name there and, and to say, you know, Ken Campbell, and he was a man, he was a man after God's own heart. That would be uh, pretty amazing, wouldn't it? All right, um, so tonight, what can we figure out about King David? Um, notice number one, we're going to talk about his giant. You can't talk about David without talking about his giant. And I don't know how much of this, we need to wrap up what time? I know you told me, and I'm 10 after. 10 after. All right. Um, 
That doesn't mean you don't speak. I'd rather you speak and, and we don't finish. That would be better, okay? So we'll, we'll kind of look at some of these verses. And uh, I really wrestled with how much do we read and look at. So much of this you probably know about. But if you look at chapter 16, we're going to be First Samuel. We'll be in First and Second Samuel tonight. Um, we'll refer to some other passages. But First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 11. Uh, Samuel said to Jesse, you remember Samuel's a prophet. He's uh, looking around. Uh, at the different men who will be king. He looked at Jesse and he said, Are all the young men here? Want well, to inquire about who, were there, who was there. And he said, uh, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So, so uh, looking for, trying to find a good replacement, finding a man who would be a man after God's own heart. And you drop down to verse 18, and there's so much in between here. But verse 18, one of the servants answered said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem, a Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a handsome person, and maybe most importantly, the Lord is with him. Now, David's a young man. We don't really know how old. Some would speculate maybe 17 years old at this time. And, and to just kind of listen to that resume about David and who he is, a mighty man of valor. Can you imagine being 17 years old, people talking about you and saying, he's, he's a, a warrior. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a, he's a skillful individual. He's a prudent individual. And top it off, he's, he's a good looking individual. So David was a shepherd. In chapter 17, you'll find it's mentioned five times where he was a shepherd. Now Saul was a shepherd. King Saul was a shepherd, but he wasn't a good shepherd. If you back up, we're on time, but back up chapter 9, you'll find that he couldn't even manage to kind of keep some donkeys of his dad together. And so they, they went astray. So when you look at David, and there's some, here's some just characteristics about David. When you think about a shepherd, you think about a spiritual shepherd in the church, or you think about a shepherd that's tending sheep. He was uh, sympathetic. He was skilled in what he was doing, and he had a lot of strength. And we'll, we'll talk later on, if we have time, about how he protected these sheep. These sheep were really important to him. And, and even though there wasn't a, a large flock, um, he was still still cared about him. So looking at David, thinking about his call, and then secondly, looking at him being a, a shepherd who's sympathetic. Anybody have any comments? Go ahead. Somebody, did you have your hand up? Don't wave your flag thing because I think you're okay. Yeah, I know it is hot. I'm a Yankee, and, and uh, so we freeze people over at Branford. All right. Um, 17, going on number two, looking at, I just titled this as coming, is coming. Chapter 17 is a story about Goliath. And uh, you find verse 20, David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came on the camp and the army was going out to fight, shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up a battle array army against army. And, and if you read the text, you'll find they were actually on, uh, on two hills, and there's a valley down at the bottom. And so Israel would be on one side, and Philistines would be on the other. And as they talked with them, there was a champion. What would be it? How, how would you define a champion? I'm sorry? A winner. A winner. Somebody who's successful. Somebody who's had battles before. And so here was a man who had the title. He was the gold belt champion. Philistines of Gath. Goliath by name. Coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. I think all of us would like to have a friend that's a, a champion. A friend that's, uh, you know, uh, big and tough. And, and uh, you like that kind of guy on your side. And so here was Goliath. He was this big guy. Well, verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. The Hebrew word there means he was exceedingly. They were terrified. Um, it, it's hard to just imagine here you're a soldier and there's an army against you and there's a, this one guy that steps out and, and according to what you read he's about nine foot nine so nearly almost ten foot tall 
And uh, and when he they look at him, they're like, we're in trouble. Okay, so verse 25, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the, the king, will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. So that's a, that's a pretty good deal. Whoever can take this giant on and, and win this giant, you're going to be wealthy, you're going to have his daughter, you're going to be a son-in-law to the king. And, uh, and only that you'll have all the, could you imagine, tax exemption. We always like tax breaks. So here it's in the Bible. Well, you get down to verse 28. Well, let me hold off there just for a minute. Um, I talked about the scene. I talked about the champion. I talked about Israel trembling. The giant, listen, here's the one thing the giant didn't know. He didn't know the God of Israel. He didn't know the God that divided the Red Sea. He didn't know the God that provided them with manna and quail when in the desert. He didn't know who he was up against. He looked out and he saw some men that were smaller than him and some men that were fearful of him. But he did not know Yahweh. So we go on to the next point here. Y'all just going, I guess I'll just preach for a while. So the giant did not know God where he covered all that. I want you to notice David's compassion. Verse 26. David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach? Hebrew word there, shame. The shame from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy or blaspheme? That's the word, that's what it means. The army is the living God. And the people answered him, saying, This matter, so shall it be for the man who kills him. Now, Eliab, that's his brother, oldest brother. He's hearing David speak, and he hears him. And he's angry, and his anger arose against David, and said, Why did you come here? You know, sometimes uh, your little brother hangs around. I was the youngest one. I was the youngest 11. And I had brothers, and I had a brother next to me, and he didn't want me hanging around him. I don't know why. I thought I was a pretty cool dude, but anyhow, he just did not want me around. Well, here I picture this guy who's thinking, why are you here? Why are you here? Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to do in your chores? He went on to say, uh, you left the sheep in the wilderness, and I know you're here because you've got pride, you're haughty. I know you're here because of insolence, because you're wicked, your heart is wicked, and you come down just to see what's going on. That's why you're here. And David said, what have I done now? <laughs> you know, that's not like a, a your little brother. Uh, listen, in verse 30, he turned to him and uh, toward another and said, said this thing. Uh, these people answered him as the first ones did. I, I wrote down three things. I hope as you look at those, his brother represents the home critic crowd. He really did question David's motives, didn't he? You know, sometimes when we do uh, something good, people will question our motives. You may have a pure heart. People may think they know you. Well, I know why you're doing that. You're doing that because you're prideful. You're doing that because of arrogance. You're doing that to be seen. Saul so, Hill later on is an official critic. He'll question uh, David's means. If you look at verse 33, we'll look at it later on. Uh, how are you going to fight him? You can't even wear this. You're just a young boy. And of course, then Goliath, he'll represent the enemy critic. He'll question David's might, verse 43, um, and call him, you know, a dog. Am I a dog? Or is, am I a dog? And so we know David's answer. David's answer is God. All right. Um, comments, anything that stands out in your mind? Wallace? Because we've got scriptures to look back at. But you see God's plan working out here. To me, this is almost identical to Joseph. It's, uh, he got no respect of his family, and he went from nothing to second to Pharaoh, and David's going to do the same thing. And uh, I just see it over and over. If God takes a hand in it, it happens. 
And, and that's a great point that you make about uh, Joseph being kind of uh, neglected and they're jealous of him and, you know, um, and, and yet how God used him. Even though he had some rough deals in his life, God still used him. And I think about David, and I said that a while ago, we, we, if time allows, we'll get into He wasn't a perfect man, but I think when you see uh, his, his uh, reaction, even in this situation, he was concerned about Israel's name, and he was concerned about how people viewed God. And that really bothered him that uh, this, the, the, he called him an uncircumcised. That just meant he wasn't part of uh, the Israelites. He wasn't part of the Hebrew family. And he wasn't uh, blessed by God, if you will. So, um, you know, it really bothered him that this guy, even though he was big stature as a man, uh, that, he would, that he would ridicule and, and uh, put to shame, if you will, the children of Israel. And so I, I look at David and I, I see some qualities coming out of this young man that uh, I think are great and some qualities that we should look to make sure we have, that we would defend God, defend His name, defend His Word. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, there's giants out there in the world. Um, sometimes those giants are just the, the ones who speak the loudest. And we feel like we're the minority, we're the smaller group, and so we don't have much say. And, and I think you look at someone like David, he's a hero because we look up to him and say, man, that was great what you did against Goliath. And uh, many of the battles that he faced. And so I, I look at David, I see some real qualities here that, that will be good for us to, to, uh, to have. One thing you might think about is that while, while uh, Joseph was his father's favorite, he wasn't, probably was not his father's favorite, not just his favorite, because he was given the, the responsibility of taking care of the sheep and then away from the family and wasn't even recognized as a potential. That's a good point you make. And, uh, you know, he wasn't in the house when Samuel came. You, you would think if he had been uh, one of Jesse's favorites, he would have been there in the house. But he wasn't there. They had to call him in. And so uh, that's an interesting uh, point that you make there. Uh, maybe, maybe he would have thought of the oldest. The oldest son always got the double inheritance. The oldest son uh, always was the one that, you know, would, would have been blessed the most and respected. And, and so David being the, the younger, the youngest, it would appear here, that... Uh, um, you know, you're right. I think he probably. But the brothers were not the for him at all. No, not toward David. Well, obviously. He's gone there on a mission to his father to take food to them. Yeah, you know, you would have thought he, he might have defended himself by saying, well, Dad told me to bring this to you, but uh, he doesn't do that. No. And so you're right. He was just doing what his dad had told him. And then when he saw what was going on, it got his attention. And he thought, you know, how dare this guy um, defile. God's people, you know, so I think that's a, a great point. Anything else? Any other comments? Y'all do a good job. All right. Um, so, David, we have this confession in verse 31. Um, David spoke, uh, when, uh, let me back up. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, think about that for a minute. Uh, Israel had some uh, trained soldiers. Uh, they would have been men. Uh, even David's brothers were, were older men. You know, and when they saw Goliath, they hightailed it out of there. They left. And here David is, you know, he's a younger man. And he said, I'll go. I'll go. Um, again, kind of showing you some courage of what a hero would be. So Saul said to David, you're not able. He's not getting a pep talk, is he, from Saul? You're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. For you're a youth. And this man is a war from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. He's going to give him a resume. I used to take care of the sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it rose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. This is a tough little dude, you know. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord, here's the key thing right here. This is what, in my opinion, makes David a hero. 
the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, okay, I've heard enough. <laughs> Go, and, and the Lord be with you. I think what's great about David, he talked about the battles with the, the bear and the lions, but notice who he gave the credit to. Gave the credit to God. And I, and I guess that to me is another thing that makes him uh, someone of integrity. We used that word a while ago. He doesn't try to steal the spotlight. Um, who knows how many times he prayed to God and thanked God for delivering him uh, from these, these creatures. All right. Um, any comments over that? We're going to move along here. Did we, we didn't cover all that. Did I miss one? The conquest. Um, we know the story. I don't think we're going to read it all because uh, of time. But we know that David faces this giant. And we know that uh, if you look at verse 42, let me just highlight a few things here. The Philistine looked about and saw David, and he was disdained, disdained him. So that he was, uh, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. They keep bringing that up, girls. I don't know. Uh, Philistine said, am I a dog? What would a dog do? A dog would scatter people. A dog would chase. And, and uh, you know, is that what you see me, a dog? And you're going to take some sticks to me? And, and he cursed David by his own gods. And the Philistine said, David, come to me and I'll, I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said, the Philistine, you come to me with sword, a spirit, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defiled. This day, here's what David said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you and take your head from you. And this day I'll give you the carcass of the camp of the Philistines and to the birds of the air and the, beast of the uh, wild beasts of the earth. And the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Know the story. He took five stones, but he only needed one. After he kills Goliath, he doesn't have a sword to remove his head. So he takes Goliath's sword. That will show up later on in the scriptures. You'll find another occasion where David showed up without a, a sword. And the only sword that was there was uh, the sword that he used on Goliath. Interesting, if you do a little research, some will tell us that the uh, Golgotha, the place of the skull, looks kind of like a, a skull is a place where perhaps David had taken the head and buried it. Others tell us that uh, perhaps Adam's body was buried. I don't, I don't know about all that. But I think it's interesting. He does take the head of, of Goliath back to Jerusalem and gives it to Saul. All right, anybody have any comments so far? You can just hear it when he speaks, can't you? The confidence that this is God's battle. This is God. You're not fighting me. You're looking at me, but you're not. You're fighting God. And he knew God was with him. Um, and it was evident that God was with him. And so, you know, you think about the, now I, I know that some people, I, I've never done a slingshot thing, but I've talked to people who have done slingshot, and I guess you can get really good at it. But even with what David would consider uh, doing something himself, he still give credit to God. And um, again, I think that goes back to being a man after God's own heart. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, just because you have confidence in God doesn't make it uh, make you perfect. Um, doesn't mean you won't fall down at times um, or struggle at times. And, and we know we know David did. But I appreciate that. I think that's a great point you bring out there about his confidence. Any other comments over? I know we kind of zoomed through the Goliath story, and that's the favorite one of most kids and uh, and adults. 
there's just so much there and, and I hope I guess what I hope by uh, what I bring to you tonight um, what I at least what I say at Burlington is I hope I'm giving you something that you'll go home it'll just make you want to go home. So I want to read about that again I don't remember how that was or how that worked out or and uh, so that's my goal is that I give you something to take and and uh, look at and build on on for yourself all right we're going to move on if there's no other comment here and um, we talk about his friend we talk about his giant we talk about his friend and um, we know that uh, him and Jonathan were very close and I'm just going to read a couple of verses just due to time. But it said in chapter 18, said when he had finished speaking to Saul, now he went to Saul and he delivered Goliath's head, if you will. When he finished speaking to Saul, the um, soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. They were together. And Jonathan loved David, loved him as his own soul. I don't know what, it doesn't tell us what was the, and I don't like to use the word attraction because people use this in sick ways, but there was a, an attraction of friendship. And I don't know what it was that Jonathan saw in David um, that said, I like this guy. But you know what, Some, that happens, isn't it? You, you might go to work and your, your first day of the job, you, you're working next to somebody and say, you know what, I like this person. They're just a, they're just a good person. And um, there was something about David that, that Jonathan just felt good about. So Saul took him that day and it would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Now, he wouldn't let him go home probably for his own good. He liked to have David around and um, he liked to have David playing his music. He liked to have David there to maybe showboat a little bit. And, and so I don't think this was for David's sake. I think this was for Saul's sake. And then you read Jonathan makes a covenant with David in verse 3. In verse 4 you find that uh, Jonathan takes off his robe. What does a robe represent? A royalty. Authority. Authority and royalty. This is King Saul's son. And he takes off his robe and he gives it to David. And uh, then he gives him his sword and his, his bow and, and his belt. Um, you talk about respect and an honor here's the the prince of israel jonathan giving that royalty to david now we know saul was um, really jealous of david when you read down in verse 7, when David came around, there were women out there and they're singing, Saul, he slayed his thousands, but David is ten thousand. And the Bible said next verse, I think Saul was furious. He did not like hearing that. So I think Saul has a, uh, will have a jealousy problem with David for a lot of reasons. And I think Jonathan may be uh, a little bit part of that, that, that Jonathan really did care uh, for David. Any other comments? The Bible doesn't get into a lot of details. It doesn't, does it? But I, I, I think probably that it was not a secret that David was anointed by Samuel. Yeah. And that was for a purpose. Right. And I think they, the rumors had it all around it that David was the true royalty and the appointed one of God. And, and Jonathan recognized that. And he knew that he he was not going to be the king. The yeah, scriptures tell us that, that David became king at 30. He was actually king while Saul was alive for about seven years. He was actually anointed, as you said. Um, he, he served for 40 years as king. And so seven of those years, he, he wasn't the kind of king you would think because he kind of had to hide out from Saul a lot. But you're right. I think um, Saul didn't like that. No. What are you going to give it to him? From a religious standpoint, 
he was the anointed one. Absolutely. From God's standpoint, he was the one God would bless. God continued to send Saul these uh, these these um, evil um, spirits, I, I guess you'd call it. I'm not sure exactly how it was quoted, but uh, things that were not favorable. And Saul recognized God is not blessing me anymore. And he recognized David was blessing him. And so uh, God was blessing David. And so I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think that was... It gets, it gets even worse. You're right. You're right. But I wanted to just kind of touch on, on this. And um, when, you, when you go down to um, chapter 2, you find where Jonathan will, will die of, um, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel. Go over 2 Samuel real quick. And um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on our last point, or at least a few minutes. But 2 Samuel, we find where Jonathan uh, dies. And, and it's a, a kind of wild story. And, and boy, you could spend some time talking about it. But an Amalekite showed up and, and said, basically, you know, Saul was uh, near death and wanted me to kill him, so I did. And uh, David I, evidently knew the truth. If you back up chapter 31, what really happened to Saul was different story. Um, but so you get to deal with, he, he brings up Jonathan has died. And so David had this, he, he just uh, lamented, I'm trying to think of how, how to phrase this, uh, the mourning and um, the crying. And if you look at the very next several verses, um, how he just moaned and mourned the death. And actually it, many would say it's a song. Uh, so I, I wanted to just kind of touch on that as an, another. There's so many things about David that um, we just can't, can't get all into. Any, any comments before we move on from Jonathan? Alright, let's talk a little bit about another big event in David's life. Um, uh, mistake, uh, if you will. Much like Eve, there's a woman who saw what she wanted, and Eve, Eve did. Uh, she took what she wanted, she ate, and, and then uh, generously gave that to her husband, um, who knew better. I'm not, not getting him off the out of trouble. That's just kind of the way Satan works. If you just kind of look at those words, and think about temptations in our life. You know, we see something and we think, you know, I, I, that's, I shouldn't do that. I know better. Uh, but we do it because we want it. And, and then after we want it, sometimes we want to get others involved in it. And so, uh, you know, if others are doing it, then we don't feel so bad about it. And that's just, I think, the way Satan functions. And I think that's the way he worked with Eve. So 2 Samuel 11, and again, there's a lot here uh, to be read, and so all that's for you to uh, take and, and read it. But uh, we know David was deceitful. We know he saw a woman that was bathing in verse 2 of, of, this, uh, of this verse. We know that he inquired about her. He was told about her. It was no secret. Uh, she was married. She married to one of his right-hand men. And, but he wanted her. He called for her. He, he took her. And um, the only words that you find from uh, Bathsheba in this whole ordeal is found in verse 5 where she said, I am with child. Now this obviously made David very nervous. Um, she's pregnant. So what does he do? He, he comes up with a plan. And sometimes that's what people do. How can I come up with a plan um, to cover my tracks? And so he, you know, he called her husband and wanted him to lay with her. And Uriah refused to. I'm not going to do that while the men are out fighting. And so uh, David thought, well, I'll get him drunk. And then he'll go. And, and that didn't work. And so David's frustration, he decides the best thing to do is just let's put him out. And put him on a battlefield and make sure he dies. Isn't it amazing how sin works? Um, sometimes you do something and instead of repenting for it, you do another sin to try to cover it and maybe another sin to cover that. And then you look and think, man, I'm in a mess here. And um, it was bad enough what David did, but what he continued to do. Um, you see the weaknesses in David. And, of course, the scripture I want to put down there is, you know, our, our sins will, will definitely find us out. Anybody have any thoughts on, on what we talked about so far? Not the most comfortable subjects to talk about, but um, David wasn't a perfect man. Started the class out talking about he was not a perfect man. 
And I'm not excusing that. I'm just telling you that we understand that. So we have this parable. Uh, Nathan comes to him and uh, gives this parable. And he talks about a, a rich man who has so much. And it was a poor man. had this one little ewe lamb. And, and uh, it's his pet. And he holds it, rocks it. I'm, I'm kind of giving you my version of it. And uh, when a stranger comes, the rich man still takes it from one of his many. He takes from this poor little guy and takes his pet that he's probably named and, you know, walks at night, whatever, and, um, and he kills that little lamb. And the Bible tells us that David, verse 5, was furious. He was angry about this. There's something interesting about this little lesson. In verse 6, he said, He shall restore fourfold for the lamb. I don't have time tonight, it's not on your sheet, but David's lost four of his sons. He lost the one that he had with Bathsheba. He had, uh, the other three were killed. And um, I think it's kind of ironic that that prophecy almost, it came back. And of course the sermon from Nathan is, you're the man. You're the man. And um, have I gotten ahead of myself here? Well, we'll go back to the confession just for a moment. Um, what I admire about David is he owned up to it, realized it in verse 13. And you'll hear this several times. He said, um, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. Because that would have been the a right thing during the law of Moses that you take a life uh, your life would be taken and uh, then you go to verse 14 he said because of this deed you have given a great occasion to the enemies to blaspheme the child also is born to you shall surely die um, and then down to verse 18 just going to go ahead and cover one more on the seventh day it came to pass the child died and the servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and we would not heed, uh, he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do some harm. Um, you kind of, that was really a, a quick overview of what happened. What kind of lessons do we learn from all this? From David and Bathsheba? That's a great point. You bring up several things there. I think David loved that boy, didn't he? Um, e even though, you know, the, the sin that came about. Um, kind of reminds me of, of Moses. We've been talking about Moses Wednesday night. And, you know, Moses, uh, he loved Ishmael. Even though that was Hagar's uh, child. He still, he loved that child. You're not, just because, you know, it's still yours. And so he loved this baby. And he mourned over that. You're right. And, uh, you know, so there, there's there's a lot of lessons there, is there? Uh, I think there's a lesson for women not to bathe naked it's outside, isn't there? I mean, there's responsibilities that, um, that, you know, part of the responsibility. One of the things, if you read uh, a lot about David, you'll find that uh, most of the time, David would not have been at home. Uh, I wrote several examples down. I don't know if I have them here or not, but you'll find that... Um, 
I don't know where I put it at, but you'll find where he, um, chapter 5, verse 2 and 8, and chapter 10, when they went to battle, he was out there in the battlefield. He wasn't a king to set back home. And, and so this was kind of a different deal for David. And I don't know, maybe he was bored or whatever, but, you know, um, being at the wrong place and, and, and not being where you should be, man, that's a good lesson for us. And, and um, you know, and then giving in. And when somebody told him, hey, that belongs, she belongs to somebody else, you know, that, that should have been enough there. So there's a lot. Anything else about this story? But, you know, that's probably true for most people that when we do something, we, we don't think about consequences, do we? Um, you know, a lot of time that happens, it happens to kids, it happens to adults that, you know, and maybe we think we'll never get caught or it won't be figured out or whatever. Um, I volunteered for 10 years in, the, in the law enforcement as a chaplain, and you find people that, you know, you catch them doing something, and, and it's like they didn't realize. I think one of the last calls I went on, a, a, a best friend shot his best friend uh, and killed him. And uh, they were drinking, and he didn't think the gun was loaded, and shot him in the heart, and, and he was gone. And, you know, you could sit back and second guess a lot of things, but, you, you know, if you, you don't think about the consequence, what's, where's this drink going to lead to? And, and where's this playing with a gun going to lead to? And what, you know, and, and uh, at last I knew, he was headed to prison, you know, over something that should never have happened. You know, just so I think you're right about that. I think David felt that way, not thinking ahead. And maybe Satan works on us that way that we don't. Hey, think things through. There's, that's a good lesson there, isn't it? A good sermon there. Think things through before you before you do it. Go ahead. Things have changed, haven't they? A, a lot of a lot of ways in the home or two minutes. Oh, you had a comment. I'm sorry. I thought you gave me a two minute warning there. <laughs> uh, just because you're a hero of the Bible doesn't mean that, that you don't have your kryptonite too. Just because you have a heart like God doesn't mean you have the heart of God and you're perfect. Excellent point. And and also here's a, here's another thing. A good way to kind of wrap it up is that. Um, because you make a mistake doesn't mean that God's going to give up on you. I, I mean, Acts chapter 2 tells us anything. It tells us these people crucified Christ, and God didn't say, hey, you know what? That's too bad. You're done. Uh, they said, what, what must we do? And, and Peter told them, repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And I think that it's just a, a great lesson, just like David. Boy, he messes up. But we all, we do. We mess up. Maybe not the extents of other people, but uh, we mess up. And it doesn't mean God is saying, I'm done with you. Um, what a good message. Yeah. I think one thing that really impresses me about David is when the sin was brought to his attention, he didn't try to justify it. Yeah. He didn't try to Good point. make excuses. He said, I've seen it. Yeah, excellent. When we read what is it, Psalm 51, we read the prayer. It, that's right. That, Psalm 51 is the response to this. And what's amazing is um, David didn't just sin against Uriah, and he didn't just sin against Israel. He sinned against God. And that's what he said. I have sinned against you, O God. And so we can, you may wrong somebody, but when you wrong somebody, you're sinning against God. That's uh, what a valuable lesson there. Well, David, David also was in a position because of his, his authority. We talk about authority and that thing consume you. I think at some point in time, David almost consumed with the authority that he had because anything that he said, anything that he did was acceptable. He even disobeyed God in some time. I mean, you know, he, he knew he had disobeyed God and, and he knew he got punished for it. I think he really realized at, this, at one point in time, at that point in time, that he had really exceeded his authority. He, he truly 
He truly repented. I think that went back to his humble beginnings as a, as a shepherd. He said, I'm not in charge. I think you, you bring up some valid points about his authority. For him to say, tell her to come here, and they said, wait a minute, she belongs to somebody else. He's tell her to come here. And you don't see them refusing, you don't see her refusing, um, and, and that's where authority got him in, in trouble. So many stories, you know, uh, Uzzah was another great one, if you want to look up Uzzah, where, you know, the ark stumbled and the ark, and Uzzah reached out, and, and when he touched it, he died, and I think it was it three months that David just mourned. He, he couldn't believe God would, would do that, you know, God is a God of his word, though, and um, so you, only the priest, Levites, could touch the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And so, so many things. And, and just kind of concluding, and I know our, our time is up here, um, just thinking about David, and, and you get over to the end of 2 Samuel, and you find you know, David's coming down to the end. And all these verses, I, I guess all of them, there's some sort of requesting God's forgiveness and, and asking God uh, when you get chapter 22 and... and um, well, he starts out this, this another song, if you will, chapter 23, 1. Let's look at that real quick. Um, here's the last words of David. Um, and, and again, you find out verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. And, and, and this is desire David had. And I think when you look at most of the Psalms, the desire David had would, was to serve God, uh, was to live for God, seek God's forgiveness. And I think that's probably why, uh, even though he had some bumps along the way, um, that he continued to come back to God and, and, and ask God. I, I like part of chapter 2 of 1 Kings. Uh, I like the part where he brings Solomon in and um, he challenges Solomon to keep God's word, to keep his precepts. I don't care for the way he treated uh, Sol Solomon when it came to Joab, but, um, but you know, here's a guy on his deathbed and, um, and his thought is on his son and how his son's going to live and make it. David was 70 when he died. We don't really know why. When you read uh, the first part, I think it's Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, all we know is he's extremely cold and he couldn't get warm and uh, so maybe pneumonia who, who knows what he might have had but anyhow as on his deathbed he brings his son in and he said keep God's word keep his statues and uh, I think all of us all of us dads and parents would you know that we see you know we'd want that to be from us to our children keep the word of God we done we're going to have an invitation song and uh, well we talked a lot about um, a God who's forgiving. You know, sometimes we categorize sins by big sins and little sins. And we think, you know, maybe it's okay to tell a little lie or not okay to, to take another man's wife or, or to try to get a man killed or, or whatever. Um, while there's consequences are different on this, on this earth. Uh, if you go down and steal a piece of bubble gum or if you go down and rob the store, we know the consequences are different. It's still sin that will send us to the devil. And um, we serve a God. And I think there's probably no better example than Acts 2 that um, Peter tells him about Jesus and how he had, uh, how he came, why he came, what his purpose was and his death and burial and resurrection. And the people were moved. You know, these same people 50 days earlier were saying, crucify him, crucify him. And they're so moved now by asking Peter, where do we find forgiveness? You know, how can we get it? Um, what we did was horrible. And thank God that Peter didn't say, there's no hope for you, sorry. And now he told the people that day the same thing that God tells us today, that if we're willing to repent and be baptized into Christ, that we can obtain the forgiveness of sins. We know if we walk in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins. We know that if we step out of the light, we need to ask for forgiveness and strength. So God's invitation is extended tonight. Um, tonight is as, as important as any Sunday or any other day because God is here. His people are here. We're going to sing and pray and we're together. So if you have a need and, and you want to make it known, we encourage you to do that while we stand together and we sing this song.